Thank you for people bringing through those words. And um, I'm not trying to single anything out so much on, you know, it's, this isn't a rating or whatever, but when Di began to prophesy, I thought, oh, that's just what I needed for, a, like to settle my heart on this word that, I, that I'm bringing this morning. I'm actually talking about end times this morning in, in um, Matthew 13. And, and um, end times, or the theology on end times, it's a much disputed thing within the kingdom of God, within, within churches, within denominations, um, even with nations and, and different points of view. Um, it's hotly debated. You very rarely get through a sermon on end times without half a dozen people coming and telling you their version. And so um, I, this morning, but because we're up to it on, on um, and very valid versions, I've got to say, you know, it's just, but there's so many points. And, and, um, and so I was just reading through it. I thought Ian did a fantastic job. He was preaching from verses 1 to 13. Uh, in Mark and uh, on Mark chapter 13 and I was going to go to about chapter 28 or up to where um, the sign of the fig tree but I said to Ian this morning you know what I, I just feel like reading the chapter in its entirety I think it's about to verse 36 Ian agreed he was going to do the same thing last week so I thought that's a, um, a bit of a heads up for me I'm a I I guess if I was breaking down my giftings and how I feel, um, you might feel I'm not. <laughs> I don't know. But I feel my giftings preaching, not teaching. And um, although I was raised by two teachers, um, Adam, my son, uh, his gift is teaching, I feel. And, and uh, he said to me, oh, Dad, it's, it's, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's all that. And he emailed me basically a sermon I could use this morning. And it was all just written out, just brrr, and uh, And I thought, you know what, Ads, how would you like to preach on the um, Man of Desolation next week? And he said, yep, that'll be good, be tight, though, because I've only got this week here, and then I'm back off somewhere else, and then I'm doing this. And this morning he's away on work. He's up in the North Island, far north on work this morning. And um, so I could preach next Sunday, and then on Thursday I go to Canada. And so uh, we're off for, for Christmas in Canada. So he's got a tight schedule, but um, he doesn't believe me. He doesn't have to get much together the way. And I felt, well, you know what? Um, when it comes to, I felt like that person that Di was talking about, jumping out of plane with no parachute, sort of stuff. Or, or, well, I did until yesterday when he said he would, you know, because I like, yeah, I'd just be plummeting towards the ground, you know, if I'm going to. So I'm going to preach my way through this chapter this morning. And, um, and it's about being watch. Keep an eye out on how many times Jesus tells you in this to keep watch, to, to, to keep watch. And so I'm going to preach about keeping watch over our heart. The trouble with, um, or not, not saying the trouble, but yeah, it is kind of thing with preach on end times. There's a couple of defaults is that actually you get so many different opinions and different, you know, of how it could all turn out. And is it rapture? Is it not rapture? Is it? post-tribulation, all that kind of thing, that, that it can be quite contentious. And the other problem with it can be it's never preached at all, which is kind of me. I, I touch on it. But the one thing I am about this is that I am passionate about the return of Christ. And I hope you are too. If you get into, if you study about end times, what it does show you is that the end result is the evil will finish. Jesus, we will be with Jesus, and he will be the center of everything in our lives. Man, do I long for that day. And what my other gifting is to share the gospel with people that haven't heard the gospel. Be Becky, you know, people are crying out to hear more than, than you could ever possibly imagine they're doing at times. Becky has a midwife who has said she is a staunch atheist. Last time she had a baby, she wanted to know how she came to faith and, uh, and how Jesse came to faith. And they were both like, well, we were sort of born into Christianity. We were raised as Christians. And then there's a time where we made it. They had their own testimony to tell. 
this time, yesterday it was, you came into our home. Can you tell me what t- made your parents go from what I am into what they are now? How did they get there? So Becky just said um, about how dad had a drinking problem or this or that and everything else. And she just put it in layman terms, you know, that he was smoking up to 60 a day. But he got what we call delivered and he just got completely set free and he got completely healed on what we call a word of knowledge and a prophetic word. The night he got saved and he got a healing in his back and, and he got set free from drinking and all those kinds of things. And he's never drunk, he's never smoked since, his back's, you know, all that kind of stuff. And she's like, oh, wow, oh, wow, 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 wow. Oh, hang on a minute. And now they're, and so, yeah, they got saved down there at the Oxford Baptist Church. Now they're pastoring the Oxford Baptist Church. Like, so they were like me, and uh, people want to hear it. People want it. People, people know their life is coming to an end. Not only that, people have a sense that the world's coming to an end at some point. That that it, see, even the news is telling you it's going to go bang one day. We're going to cook. We're going to fry. Whatever it is. You know, with artificial intelligence right now, they've got it. They, it's just increasing and increasing and increasing. It's been making decisions for businesses. Businesses have been based on computerized information. You know, here's the information, and out it comes. I just heard the other day someone was telling me now that they've got artificial intelligence to a point where um, they can give it half, say, half a story of a book and then get it to predict how it ends. And it's so far, it's so, far, it's so um, more advanced than people can predict. So with filling in that information and, and everything else, what, how your business is and all that kind of stuff, there's so many decisions around us being made by artificial intelligence. Remember all this information being made without emotion. And so, without love, it's what, it's what happened. That's what happened with Stalin and everything else. You know, we owe it to Russia to be like this and get rid of everybody else. There was no emotion. Cambodia did it with the killing. All those kinds of things. I'm not trying to get political here, but people feel that's going to go bang one day. We're talking about nuclear. We talk about global warming. And so. The, thing, the one thing about Scripture is that Jesus did give us a bit of a roadmap. And we'll line that out a little bit next Sunday. But I'm going to read um, verses 13 because, well, actually, and just on that, I, when I came to faith, that's why I've got a bit of an analogy, and I don't mean to spread it through the church, is that when I came to faith, I came to faith on end times teaching by a guy called Barry Smith. Barry Smith was a stunning teacher in all this, but um, he's passed away a few decades ago. But there were a lot of predictions in his book, Warning, Final Warning. I think he had two or three books. Um, and the Bible talks about, in Revelation, how the, the beast will have a number 666, and Henry Kissinger's name added up to 666 in the Hebrew. And so there was a lot of dots being joined and everything else, and there was all kinds of things happening. And then I got caught up with a different guy um, who lives not far from here, and he, made, he filled in a lot of gaps, an awful lot of gaps. It very nearly took me out of Christianity. Fear will do that. Fear will make you knuckle down and trust in yourself. And if you're going to end up trusting in yourself, there's only one way that goes. It just ends up in complete unbelief. And after a few years with this guy, I was traveling down that road. Thank you uh, for all the saints that were praying for me 30-odd year ago, for Joy and I. Because, and, and the word here that Jesus has is, be careful, don't be deceived. Even the elect can be deceived. So keep watch. Never in the history of man, or in the church, I should say, do we need fellowship more than ever. I believe, because of deception. Once upon a time, it was needed around protection, hiding one another, sharing food. Right now, it's deception. 
It is, there are churches falling. There are ministries, men of ministry, women of ministry, who were so strong as in their Christian faith, now more into universalism than we've ever seen before or heard before. In other words, Jesus is not, in their mind, not the only way to be saved. Men of stunning faith and giftings and communication. And Jesus warns us to, to, be, to, be, to keep watch. And I don't think we all have a singular answer, but together we can watch out for one another. Together we can be truthful and love and care. So Mark 13, verses 1 to about 36, I think it is. Sorry, I don't know what's wrong with this paper this morning. Everything's stuck together, including my tongue. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what, mass, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're all about to be fulfilled? And Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. And these are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogue. On account of me, you will stand before governors and, thing, and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you're arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever's given you at the time, for it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father is child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to enter the house or take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers Pray that this will not take place in winter because those days of those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or look, here he is, do not believe it. For the false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he'll send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that the summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away, leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the roosters crow or at dawn. 
If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. That's the entirety of the chapter. There's so many things happening in there, but the big thing here is, is to watch. And, and it, it even seems like repetitive at times. It starts off at saying watch. At the end, it's saying watch. And it's warning and it's warning and it's warning. Um, Teresa had no idea what we'd be preaching on this morning because she's been preparing for Ignite and she's um, out there now. But at the prayer meeting this morning, she had a word and her word was that when she lived in Africa, um, you just you went and you stayed at other people's places because there was safety in numbers. And as a family, they went. And, um, and this is when she was, she was younger. And, and um, when she was a little girl, so this was about her parents. But her brother didn't want to sleep in the spare bed. And so at this point... Um, the, the parents couldn't go home because it's not safe to travel at night in the day. See, we live in a safe country, don't we? So it wasn't, it's not safe to travel home in the dark on your own, as a, even just as just one vehicle. And so they had to stay the night. But, but I'm sure it was a brother. He's not going to go to bed. So he sat up all night, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited. And he just stayed there um, just watching out the window, and he waited till the sun rose. And... Yeah, that's determination, isn't it? For any of us who are just going to sit up at night and just watch the sun to come up. But Jesus is saying, be on watch. Be on watch every hour. You ever been woken up in the night and you know you just got to pray? Something's going on. Something's happening. I, I, I got emotional when Becky had a baby. And uh, had a wee baby girl, Maisie. And I, I, I didn't know why. I mean, she's my seventh grandchild. And man, was I stoked with these other fellas coming into the world and all that kind of stuff. Man, I was stoked when Sela was born and born in our house, you know, and, and um, not meant to be. Is she? But I woke up in the morning. See, Jesse come and knocked on the door at four in the morning and said, hey, we're off. You're on. You're a babysitter. So see you later, Jesse. Have fun. I was awake at about five o'clock. I was quite emotional. And I didn't know why. For Sela, for those of you who haven't heard this story, um, our daughter-in-law and Adam and just Adam's wife, and they just live out um, on Depot Road, just five minutes away. It was a really, really stormy night. It was a, it was a horrendously stormy night. And, as, and, and they were going to try and get down to Rangura Hospital. And it was back when there was floods and that storm and they were going to close all the one-lane bridges. Um, and that left them in an island. They couldn't get out. So they had to do a runner. And they got as far as our place. And um, they got up our driveway and Brenda was in such a way that she was ready to give birth and so they, Joy took her down to our ensuite and birthed our wee granddaughter with Brenda there on our ensuite floor and Sela was going to be named Sela someone else but she asked could she name her Sela Joy. Becky, do you remember the storm we had on Thursday night? That lightning, did you get lightning and we got hail and everything else there. It was incredible. Thursday, it was on Thursday morning that Becky had a baby. Went down, and um, the similarities are incredible. She felt she needed. I'm allowed to. I asked Jesse. He said, "Yeah, it's fine." And um, um, but uh, she had to go. She she felt she just had to have a wee. She went in there. Baby was born on the bathroom floor, and the hospital came out with such force that it snapped the cord. Blood everywhere. They're worried about Becky hemorrhaging because she's had a cesarean, so they're worried about that that would tear everything away from the from from the wall from the afterbirth and things. The buttons were pushed. It was code red. There was five doctors. They got Jesse out, spun him around, but at the end, bring him back in and and um, show him. And uh, like you need to see this. This is what it looked like. I don't know. 
I was a midwife that did that. No, you need to come back in and have a look. But she's called Maisie Joy. And that night there was a storm. I was like, Lord, what is it with these middle names, both of them being called Joy? Both of them on days that had horrific storms. Both of them came with such speed and everything else. And I've just felt the Lord say to me, because Greg, in any storm I can bring joy if you look to me. And on Friday morning, Thursday morning, see, I just didn't pick up what the Spirit was saying. The enemy doesn't care if, if, if you're a newborn, or unborn or whatever. He'll try and take you out. He hates you. And there's coming a time to the end of his reign. And scripture talks about how he's going to ramp up everything. I'm not saying just ramped up here or whatever like that. But, but so I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe, you know, when two babies are born in such a hurry and both their middle names are, um, are joy and, and the storms. I just feel like that was just, a, I don't know if it's a word for me, word for our family, word for the church. I just thought I'd share it. But I, as I'm sharing it, I'm feeling there's ones here. That actually you need to know that in your storm, God can bring joy. She, you know what? He delights to bring joy where the enemy tries to bring destruction. He delights in it. He absolutely... He, is there any bigger calamity than the cross? From a worldly point of view? You look at the joy that we receive through a God who came and laid down his life through his son, that he could raise him from the dead, that we can have, he suffered death, that we can have life eternal. And as Jesus talks about it, he's saying just keep watch. Well, what does keep watch look like? You know, and, and he talks about how, he talks about how people, um, um, fathers against sons and Everything else is happening. Every, you know, like brothers will betray brothers, sisters, sisters, mothers, daughters. Some are going to be put to death. That's a terrible situation. That's how when things get tight, when, when panic sets in, you know, it's, it's recorded in history that when Nero decided to blame, see, I'll just back up a little bit the abomination of desolation that set, that sets itself up and there's an indication that it sets itself up in the temple of God. And so one of the arguments about end times is that, well, has this already happened because lots of the other Caesars tried to do certain things that in the temple before it got pulled down and burnt down and, and, and everything else. And so they're saying, yeah, it's already passed. But then um, Jesus is very clear in, in his description of what happens. That actually, it's flee from Jerusalem, and actually nobody fleed from Jerusalem. Then some people ran and pleaded for things not to happen and asking Caesar to take these things out. And Nero at one point, um, or Caligula, he set up some things that he wanted to put in and desolate the temple. But one of the generals there in charge of Jerusalem, he refused to do it. And Caligula was later on assassinated. He only had a reign of about four years. Nero, I, I can't remember if he was assassinated or committed suicide. Suicide, yeah, thank you. So, and and um, I think about four-year reign. It was a short, short reign. And, um, um, but he blamed the Christians. And he said that the Christians were an abomination to Rome. Um, because he blamed the fire, he, blamed, he just blamed the fire. But why he called them an abomination is because they held the name of Jesus higher than anything else. Hallelujah. But some Christians, historians noted, that actually sold out on other Christians when it came to the persecution. When you're being faced with being fed to the lions or give us 20 names... Ian, I remember reading out a story. He was in tears reading it out. And it was a, in Romania, when communism was reigning, actually this guy was, it's what, this testimony is what's founded, Voice of the, 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 um, Voice of the Martyrs Association. And the guy there was being tortured to give up names of other Christians, to just give, give us their names and we'll stop the torture. And the torture was horrendous. And finally, because he didn't give up any names, 
they brought in his 14-year-old son who had been in prison. And they stood over, they had made him kneel down and they stood over his head. How many kids? So if you've got little kids here, maybe just put your hands over there. And, um, and they said, we'll kill him if you don't give us names of Christians. And at that point, and, and this man's just been tortured, and at that point, um, he said, all right, stop, stop, stop. And he was about to give up some names. And his 14-year-old son said, do not disgrace our family by becoming a traitor. Let them do what they have to do. My hands in the life of the Lord. So they smashed his head with the baseball bat in front of his father. Completely died. It was a short time afterwards this father's injuries were so severe that he knew he was dying and he pleaded with everybody in that every Christian in that prison, please, communism's about to fall. And when it does, and they find out the atrocities that happen in this prison, they will want to kill every guard that has worked here. And it is up to you to defend them for the gospel's sake. That's how he died. Like, wow, what forgiveness, what strength. And Jesus talks here about that father will betray son and son of father and brothers and like in these times, things are going to happen that we've never seen. Like so, if the and Adam will talk about the the um, mainly about the abomination of desolation. He'll take prophecies from Daniel and Revelation and different things, and you'll you'll see him. He'll go click click click. It'll all be up there. But for us, can you just imagine what that pain would look like? I mean, if Hiroshima wasn't bad enough if the gulags weren't bad enough, if, if the Holocaust wasn't bad enough, that we're going to see stuff that's not been equaled, if the flood wasn't bad enough when everybody was trying to get onto that boat. I've, I've heard of um, people that, we've probably all heard the stories, you heard the saying, saved by the bell. Have you heard how that came about, saved by the bell? Is that they were burying a lot of people with the plague and they hadn't already died. And, um, and actually, they, didn't, they hadn't realised, but what they were doing when, it, say, you were buried in a casket, and, um, uh, and then later on, so, say, your spouse died, they thought, well, you probably decomposed it, but we'll put you in the same casket because you're going to go into the same grave. And so they just dug things up, and then when they took the lid off, they found they all had these scratch marks underneath the lid. And so what happened was they realised that actually some of these people were coming too after they were being buried. So um, what they did was after they buried someone, they had a string, go- they put a, 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 a string around your wrist or something, had it going up to a bell, and that's where the saying the graveyard shift came in because they had someone sitting in there at night to listen to see if, if, if a bell would ring, and that's what it was, saved by the bell, and they'd start digging frantically. It's like, I don't know why they just get, you learn about pulses and things before that. I don't know, you know. But that's, but that's where it all came from. All that to say, could you imagine what it would be like, the, the scratching to get to the top of the mountain, to the top of the pile, when the waters are increasing? And you were saying, we're not seeing, we've seen nothing. We've seen nothing yet in those times. I've, when COVID hit, not just New Zealand, but the world. I felt, and there's a lot of prophecies at the time, but I really felt it was a time, you know, like there would be a test on the church. And there would be a test on how we are as neighbours and friends and how we are as brothers and sisters. And all the way through, you know, whatever we do, the main thing is that we love one another and that we accept one another. And... Jesus said here that, you know, like nation would turn against nation. When we decided to do certain things here, you know, how we would run things here at church and what we would do and if there's mass or no mass, all that kind of stuff. Other churches had different things and lots of churches had, they said, well, why aren't we doing what you're doing and we should be doing what, you know, all that kind of stuff. But nations were doing it too. 
nations were like, well, Sweden's gone for herd immunity. My doctor told me England, she's, she's Scott, and, well, England sat on its hands in the UK and thousands of people needlessly died because they didn't make everybody get vaccinated and they didn't do this and they didn't do that. And there's just all these different opinions and there's nations against nations and, and so there's going to be all kinds of things happen and I, th- and, and I think it was a really good way uh, to see on a, on a very mild level how quickly things can go awry if you don't set your heart on Jesus. And Jesus is saying at the end here, you know, when, when he comes, he's gonna, the, the moon will be darkened, the sky will be darkened. A lot of people in Jesus' time, they put faith in the stars that actually they had powers and they were identities. That's sort of coming back in a little bit now too. It's like with Matariki, oh, they are our ancestors and things that I know. Some believe it, some don't, but some really do believe it. Believe me, some Christians are talking like this. I've been in places where they, where it's, well, the hui, where, where we were listening to it. But Jesus said it's all going to be dark and it's like there's, it's going to lose their power. I remember, well, the, in the people's minds, I remember reading about the Mayans who worshipped the sun god until someone one day said, you know what, it's not much of a power when a cloud the size of your hand can blot out the whole sun, when it can rain for day after day after day after day. And they discovered that after sacrificing countless thousands to the sun god. So out of all these things, Jesus, everything is counted. And he said, don't worry about when people say, hey, I'm this. See, he's saying they'll even be healings. That's why Jesus is reluctant to give anybody a sign. Previously in the, in the book of Mark, people are asking for signs, and it's usually a sign of their own unbelief. And that's why they're asking. But this time the disciples are asking, and he gives them. He gives them a whole chapter of signs. It's interesting, just even a little side note is that, that you know, who reads, uh, let him who reads this understand it. Either Jesus said that and he knew it would be written down and given, or Mark's put in a little editorial note. But it's saying that actually understand it and, and be aware but it's, not, but it's not fair. It's the whole thing is to just look to him. What I fear in the West is that we've, see, we've increased in affluence markedly over the last few hundred years. When you got just a few hundred years ago in England and different things, when I, you're reading about the child labor houses, that was capitalism at its, like, I think, at its extreme you know, because like if you didn't have money, well, then you were just beholding to anyone who would give you a job and orphans and different things doing horrendous jobs. And it's not just in England. It's just the, the things that I was reading about. There's many other nations in that. And so what, ha- you know, and that's capitalism at its worst. Well, we've, we've got a, a measure of socialism now, whether we understand it or not, because actually we do have taxes that we take it off those who are making money and we give it to those who don't have jobs. So we've got a level of socialism that's operating and different things. But, and so that's why they say that actually never of the poor, and that this isn't, you know, but, but they've never been so well off in countries like New Zealand because there is benefits that get paid out. Not every country has it. When I visited Turkey, you had to be 18 before you could get the dole. You got it for six weeks and you could never get it again for the rest of your life. That is why you saw people on push bikes and they had wool packs, um, fadges we used to call them, and they would have one on the handlebars stacked up high in plastic bottles and one on the back and they're wheeling it home and they've got to wash all those bottles and that's enough for the day to get one meal for their family and they do it all over again the next day. And we were there in their summer and it was getting dark by the time they were wheeling these home. I've been in Indonesia with, on the, on, in the rubbish dumps and that, and what you don't see on TV so much is when you see people in the distance 
getting food and plastic to recycle out of the rubbish dumps. What you don't see is these flies that sit about that high off the ground and they just go in this constant cloud as they walk through them. And some people really know what poverty is like. You know, but, the, but in the West, well, not so much. Not so much. And, and our comfort can make us... So Jesus is saying here, you know what? It, it'll get tough. It'll get really tough. It'll be worldwide. Um, things that are going on. And actually, and that is a part of it because if, if you don't know that that's going to happen, well, then when it does happen, maybe that would rock your faith, wouldn't it? But if you know it's going to happen, well, then you know you need Jesus. And not then, you need him now. You need to build up faith now. We need to keep watch now and all the way through. And so what does keep watch look like? Well, he's talking I think, too, about keeping watch over our own heart so we're ready, so our, so our oil lamps are full. I went in and I saw Jordan Peterson. Um, it was on Sunday night. It got slid across to Sunday night. And uh, there's a, I know there's one or two here that, that went as well, and they've texted me and emailed me and, and different things and just sharing a few thoughts and stuff. And, and I, I went in with Kyle and, and Adam and... and um, I, like I just, anyway, um, he was sharing a lot of things and his wife shared a story at the beginning and shared about how uh, she just went on a holiday with her sister-in-law is in Hawaii. They went for a thing where it's called swimming with the sharks and, um, and what she didn't realise that when she got there, they said, I oh, will guarantee that you'll see sharks because this is where all the fishermen come and um, they gut and fill it all their fish, and they throw all the waste over, so they'll be here looking for a feed. And there they are getting in, and they're swimming with them. And they said, so are they safe? And they said, well, no, not really. That's the idea of what you're doing. You know, it's, you know, it's like a challenge. It's a this and a that and everything else. So what they said was that actually don't, don't, don't swim away from them. They think you're food. Don't swim straight at them because they think you're challenging them. So you just, you're best to swim with them in the same direction they're going and they think you're one of them. And when they look at you and they will look at you, look them in the eye. Just look them in the eye and just keep on swimming with them. And that's what she did. I fluked, I fluked this when I was in Great, Great Barrier Reef because I swam way out because they said you can swim out. And on the trip there, they said, on the boat, they go, because you're 40 kilometres off a Great Barrier Reef, you're 40 kilometres off the mainland because you've got to get far enough away from the bottlefish that can kill you, the crocodiles that can eat you, and you've got to get up to where the water gets slightly cooler. And, um, but the trouble with that is um, there's bigger sharks. But they said, where you are, it's right on the reef. Don't worry about the reef sharks. They're great. Get out of there and call out for help if you see a whopper. But the reef sharks are fine. And so I went out there, and I'm swimming with the... And these reef sharks turned up, but they told me they were fine. So I, they just swam past. They, sometimes they swam over me. Sometimes they swam under me. They circled around, did all kinds of things, and off they went. And on the way back, I said to the guy, oh, I saw your reef sharks, the biologist. And he goes, no, you didn't. Uh, there's not many out there. You'd be pretty unfortunate. Bump. And I was like, unfortunate? Okay. So he goes, and there's three types. There's white tip grey tip, black tip, and he, he said to me, what type are those? Black tip. And he goes, oh, yeah, okay, you saw the reef sharks then. Well, what did they do? You know, he's, he's questioning me. I was sharing the story in church when I came back, it's about 15 years ago, and someone said, well, they saw sharks when they were out there. His wife panicked, and she was like Donald Duck running on top of the water trying to get back to the boat, and the sharks come up and grabbed them and grabbed a hold of his hand, and he showed me the scars on his arm while his wife was... Um, spinning away to safety. So I had no idea, but I was looking these things in the eye just, just as you did, and Jordan Peterson used it as about actually in danger. You've got to face your fears. You've got to look them in the eye. You can't hold back. No one wants to be beaten or flogged in the synagogues and things like that. No one wants that. No one wants to be cancelled. Some of this cancellation stuff online is brutal. 
this, Jesus is talking about something really serious here because what he's talking about is when, when ones betray one another, he's talking about brothers and family. He's talking about family. And in Jewish culture, family was very much your identity. It was, ve- it was very unlikely your identity was totally just in you as an individual. My name's Greg, son of Reg, father of Tara, Adam, Kyle, Rebecca, grandfather of da-da-da. That my, your identity was, was in family. And then all of a sudden, so what happens? What happens if you've got this family structure that's built and like this is your highest thing because my family's doing this and I've got so many sons and I've got, you know, whatever it is and they're doing this and then they're doing that. It can be like the stones that Jesus talked about in the temple and you could build a temple in your heart to something that's, not, that's got it out of a line with the Lord and you've got to begin to, maybe dismantle that stone by stone. Maybe it's all got to come down. And that scripture that if you see you've got to fall upon the rock or the rock will fall upon you. It's God's grace that he'll begin to deal with you. It's God's grace that he'll begin to, the idols that are in our heart that we will have trouble dealing with if it's forced upon us. And so then you... And so, so Jordan Peterson, one of the questions people wrote in and they asked questions and, and, and then everybody online voted and, um, and they just asked, you know, and so this one was, I can't remember exactly how it was, but, but it was this, this is about like keeping watch on our heart. So I think this is the right response after COVID and everything else actually. That's what I was thinking when I was talking. So someone writes in and they go, my father died. And we didn't get on, and we didn't get reconciled before he died, and he died suddenly. Now what do I do? And um, in typical Jordan Peterson style, he takes about five minutes of silence just to think about how he's going to answer it. And when he began to answer it, I thought he was emotional when he started. You know, and and um, he does get quite emotional when he's talking about things. And he said, well, I have to make a whole lot of assumptions. And because you're writing, and I, I'm just going to go, like, perhaps there was a real rift. Perhaps it was something real solid. So I've got to make all these assumptions. But I'll, I'll make these assumptions because it's quite often a normal situation. And because, because it was probably like this, and you're feeling like this miles apart, but you really had a love for your dad, and I'm sort of ad-libbing a lot of this now, that you really wanted to do something, and, but the riff was bad. And then all of a sudden, it's all get taken away. So now what do I do? What do I do with this hole now? How do I repair this? You know, is it, am I going to feel like this for the rest of my life? It's unrepairable. And he, he, and he said, well, first of all, it's to start looking at it, you know, because you're his child. So maybe, maybe you've picked up some traits too. Maybe you've picked up some things in your life that are very much like your dad's. And in some way, maybe you began to contribute to that rift, to that blockage. Maybe there was something there that if you said it in a different way or if you hadn't reacted or had you spoken sooner, had you said it truthfully, had you not covered it up or pretended it didn't exist. All the, I'm just adding a lot of things but because it was sort of a culmination of a whole lot of things else he's talking about. And, and, if, and if you can actually begin to identify something in your own heart that you can work on. See, because if you, you've, you've got to actually, what are you going to do? There's no wand. You know, you can, yes, you can forgive, but then why do we, why do we forgive yourself? Why do you keep on coming back to this and, and as Christians, we know that sometimes we have to come back and forgive and forgive and forgive and the same thing. Not that it's kept repeating, but we just have to keep going over in our heart. Look, wow, this still hurts. And so if you're actually beginning to do something, and so actually you can recognize this and you can change those parts in your life that can perhaps need to change. And then maybe you can look around and your family or other relationships, there's something else going the same way. Well, maybe, you know, it doesn't have to go this way now. 
maybe I can be honest here. Maybe I can be brave. Maybe I can look the shark in the eye. Maybe I can, I can do this. Maybe I can make a difference now. And maybe you can work on those relationships. And in the end, he said, it is possible, is it, is it, he sort of asked the question, is it, is it kind of possible that spiritually in that, it can be like a spiritual reconciliation with your father? Maybe you can come to a place where you can truly forgive yourself. I thought, wow. And I think, you see, until you can understand reconciliation in yourself, we're not going to be a people who can reconcile the world to Christ. Someone who is screaming out for more of Jesus, to meet him. And, and in that, there's this, I think there's this yearning from the Lord that his bride would be ready and watchful. Ian said to me something the other day, and, and um, I said, yeah, I've really got to work on that, you know. Well, three weeks later, yeah, I've really got to work on that. You've, you've got to, you, you've actually, you, you see, you can say it, but not do it. So what are you going to do? What is it? What, how can you break it down into bite-sized pieces. Well, I can deal with that little bit. I can deal with that little bit. I can deal with this. And all of a sudden, you get on a bit of a roll. I've battled with my weight. I always battle with my weight. Um, uh, through no other reason than I love food. And, and um, so I did a keto diet and it worked really well a few years ago. And I lost 15 kgs in about six weeks. I did, I did it about two or three weeks ago, and I lost six kgs in 10 days. And, um, but I could hardly stand up. I was just really, really weak. I'd go down to feed the pigs, and I was just out of breath. I thought, this is, it's, I just, it's just not doing it for me. And so um, I thought, well, you know what I'll do? I'll go back to, um, I'll try this intermittent fasting. There's different ways you can do it, but I've tried the way where you only just eat for six or seven hours. All your eating's done in that block. So I sort of start about up past 12 and I'm done about up past six, that's it. And I just have two meals. The idea is there's just no insulin spikes for those other 18 hours, you know, um, 17 hours. And, um, and, and, it, and it works for me. But here's the thing. Um, so I'm actually really looking forward to fasting, like days, because I've, I've got on it just to go from half past six at night to half past 12 the next day is a piece of cake. And I just, I could go more. Once you, so my thing is that once you be, start to do something, once you introduce a discipline and in a different area that's been a bit unruly, you see, you start, to, you start to get traction. God loves it when his people are in faith and in traction because I've been praying, Lord, please show me. Show me because... You know, I need my blood pressure down. I need this down. I need to live. You know, I want to, A, I have a family I love. B, well, no, actually, that's B. A is, I have a wonderful God who I really want to serve. And I want to serve with all my might until my last breath. Until my last breath. I want to be way better at sharing the gospel to those who need to hear it. I, need, I want to be way more spontaneous. I enjoyed being at Kyle's party the other day and she, um, for Re Francis just turned five and just sharing the gospel. Jenny had a thing this morning and it was about people feeling like they've just dropped their mantles. And um, so I'm just going to finish now. Would you like to stay in church? And, and um, you're very welcome to come up. Uh, I will get the worship team up. Thanks, Esther. Got a whole lot of scriptures in there. Actually, because Matthew 5. Could you just bring up Matthew 5, bro? Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him. He began to teach them and he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they'll inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. I am. See, blessed are the meek. Meek means that you that you have a sword, you know how to carry it, but you keep it sheathed. It's probably the best description I've heard of meek. See, Peter had a sword, and Jesus told him it was fine to have a sword. But he pulled it out and he cut off a guy's ear. Wrong place, wrong time. Should have kept it sheathed. We don't inherit the earth by force. We, we inherit it in faith and in love. At the same time, you see, I, I feel like people have dropped their sword. They've dropped their mental. I really witnessed with what Jenny said. And I believe the Lord would say, just pick it up. Just pick it up. I like that scripture in Philippians now, Tyler. See, Paul said, not that I've already obtained all this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold for that which is Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. There's another way of translating that, and it's the upward call of God. You know, you have an upward call. You have an upward call. And so, Father, I, I thank you for everyone here, Lord. You didn't tell us how rough it was going to be to scare us. You told us how rough it would become. And we don't know, and no man knows the timing. We don't know when it is. But, Lord, you've given us signs to watch out for, which we will cover. But, Father, I thank you that you've asked us to prepare our hearts, that you've asked us to walk in truth and in love. And, Lord, as, as it says, we went through COVID and we didn't come out the other side very well sometimes. I think we did all right, but actually around the world and around many places, there's antagonism still. And, Father, I pray that we would be a people of reconciliation, that we could look and go, the one thing that unites us is, is you, Jesus. We're called to be lovers of you. We're called to serve you. We're called to talk about you. We're called to preach your name. You say you'll call us between, before authorities and you'll give us the words. Father, let none of us shrink back. Let us be people of love and conviction, actually walking it out actually walking in love with each other. So, Father, I pray for ones this morning. Lord, as we pick up our mantles, as we pick up our giftings, as we prepare to fight the good fight, we just, I pray your blessing. I pray your favor. I pray your voice be heard clear. Lord, I pray we would see what we're watching out for. We would hear what we're to listen for, that we would know when we see it, when we hear it. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. If um, Ian had a word for healing this morning, and if you would love, if you would love to be prayed for for healing, I mean, we would love to pray for you. We thank you for Lord the healings we're seeing. If you feel like you just would like to come forward, like actually, I just want to pick things up. I just feel to pick it up again. I feel to pick up what I used to walk in. I long to be renewed in that gift. I long to be renewed in that journey to feel the favor of God on me again. I, I, we'd love to pray for you for that. So just come, feel free to come forward as...